Article 15. Thank you very much for that. Five minutes so, include. Yeah? Five, yeah, five minutes include. Within this time? Yes. 12, 15. Okay, so up to 12, 10. We have six, seven minutes. So the best thing is immediately to open the floor for discussion and collect a number of questions and then give maybe half a minute to each of the uh, panelists here. So can I see the number of hands here first? Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, if pre <laughs> let, let me start from non if pre Ah, yes. Here. Please, sir. Well, there was a lot of discussion in the previous ses session on food security. And I think it was justified because uh, whatever we may talk about the nutrition, a minimum amount of calories is absolutely necessary, 1,800 calories or whatever is the norm. And if there is no program to ensure that, uh, that much of calories, certainly we cannot proceed further in terms of nutrition uh, enhancement. And in that context, the universalization of the food security program or the right to food was mentioned. It's a noble idea. It is the idea where we should be going. But I've got three major doubts whether we can today at this stage go for the, the universal uh, food security or should we hasten slowly. The first is that we are over optimistic in our food grain production. That euphoria of this year uh, is one thing and it is not only last two or three drought years that the food uh, production was declining it is a story of a decade that we have not been able to go beyond 2.2 percent and if something marvelous happens in coming one or two years it's a different story so but we have to be cautious second we are over optimistic about food prices with the type of food prices which we have witnessed and the, all the indications are that the food prices are remain, going to remain very high internationally and it will be difficult for us to contain it. Now, once the, and the significance for the nutrition and food intake is that once the food grain prices are high, the error of inclusion become more sharper than the error of exclusion. People who would normally not go for, for, uh, for PDS, etc., they will also go for uh, for food if the prices are 18, 20 percent. Not the richest of the rich, but those who are above poverty line, but uh, who are not entitled to otherwise. In this, uh, therefore, in this context, we have, we have to see whether we can do whatever the objective is in a more phased, systematic way. And our history of all other programs has been that we started cautiously. Which our programs are successful, as the previous uh, speaker suggested. Then we progressed it and made it universal, which is understandable. But to do it is to give the dog a bad name and hang it. Finally, on the question of nutrition, what is worrisome to me, and I'm, I would like to share, is that the the one of the, the ingredients for nutrition and aspect, especially for the poor, are self-production or self-provisioning of milk self-provisioning of vegetables, etc. There is a plateau in the productivity of all these supplementary sectors, and that is worrisome. <laughs> if your food production not increasing that much, and if the production of milk and, uh, and vegetable fruits also is reaching a plateau, there is something very serious happening on nutritional front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. John Coonrod, The Hunger Project. I want to raise the question of um, one of the big gaps that we've seen, my colleagues in India, where all these things come together, and that's in the panchayats, and specifically in the statutory committees of the panchayats, which by and large do not exist. And it would seem that perhaps one of the highest leverage strategies that could be taken would be to invest in the capacity building and the establishment and the accountability of statutory committees for health, education, nutrition, agricultural development, because these the front line um, of the entire govern democratic governance mm -hmm. is missing in the villages. Okay. Can we go at the back there? Yeah. <coughs> if you have specific question, and let the panelists know whom you are addressing that question to. Uh -huh. Yes, myself here, Dr. D.K. Madan from Punjab University. Mm -hmm. 
my specific question is to professor mahinder dev mm -hmm. we see that the working of uh, pds in india is not satisfactory mm -hmm. as it uh, constituted only 11% uh, of the total per capita consumption in rural india mm -hmm. and uh, further the excess of pds is uh, lower in the male nutrition states like bihar odisha and others so my specific question is that why the policy of uh, inclusive growth is not uh, benefiting the excess of uh, uh, <coughs> pds in the male nutrition states okay thank you, thank you. Quite a few. Yeah. Uh, this Dr. Mahindra Dev, we did a study, I'm from the Indian Institute of Dalit Studies, we did a study on uh, gender and NREGS and how sensitive NREGS was and we found that um, while NREGS, the income earned from NREGS was being uh, utilized to buy food, what NREGS was not being able, the work that was not being able to, um, uh, you know, was not sensitive was to the, to single widowed women and single women because the NREGS works was being offered in pairs and um, also the pregnant women were, uh, were the most vulnerable in that study of Madhya Pradesh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we go? Uh, the question is for Dr. Pangali, and it's uh, Brad Gilmore of Agri-Food Canada that's uh, talking. Um, just like to ask the question and then give three little anecdotes that support it, and then ask Dr. Pangali, and then the, perhaps the others. Um, and I guess my question is, in light of what we've heard, is food security only assured via public agencies? And I think that gets back to what Dr. Binswager was saying this morning. Now, Chile was a significant food deficit country in the 1960s and early 70s, but through public-private partnerships on infrastructure, but then largely privately driven production, procurement, and value-added activities, they actually have emerged as a sig significant net exporter. Um, Singapore is a city-state. They're basically food secure through acumen and trade. China, over the last 20 to 30 years, has a virtual miracle by harnessing uh, more and more incentives and market-based forces. So they're the answer, you know, looks to be more market-oriented. And so I, I'm just yeah. asking, is it the preview really of public yeah. agencies only to provide okay. food Great. security? Thank you. Uh, I think I have to apologize. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, the panelists will not be able to respond at all. And uh, already the signal is there. <laughs> uh, quick, uh, can I uh, go in the reverse order, maybe? Or Quick, half a minute. Uh, uh, on PDS, uh, it's true that uh, you know the uh, particularly where malnutrition is high, the PDS access is very low. So that's the point uh, making. How do you improve uh, the uh, PDS uh, in particularly in the high mal malnutrition states? I mean, I'm not a very advocate of universal or uh, this thing, but uh, you know the. Delivery systems are important. It is not uh, working in some of these states. Uh, like Professor Mantra said that we can go for you know different categories of reasons, different kind of uh, policies. On NREGS, that is true that there is uh, I mean, some discrimination and all. The, there are some, uh, other problems. Uh, but the crash facility is also not available in many many of the uh, NREGS sites. So. Thank you. I think sure. Just to say that, you know, we are also looking not just at food production, but food procurement. And I think there are several avenues by which the food, food procurement for public distribution could be increased. And I'd be happy to share the notes uh, with you because the experience suggests that it is possible through local procurement, uh, through we're including millets as well, and uh, that would also increase by about five to six million tons and so on. But I can share the numbers with you. Uh, we are also arguing for a phasing. We are not <laughs> saying that do it right now. And I think a lot of the discussion will take place on when is the most appropriate time to face it. And by saying that we are looking at 90% rural inclusion coverage, I think the errors of inclusion would be minimized. I wouldn't say. One is that I think as far as children are concerned, one must have a sense of urgency and not think about practicality of the issue because it's just impractical for a child to be hungry uh, in, from the child's perspective. Uh, then uh, I fully agree that the local self-government, 
the panchayats have a huge role to play in tracking every child and to see that the children's access to all their entitlements are in place uh, and in also monitoring the institutions at the ground. Thank you. So I was asked a very specific question on whether public agencies can help ensure food security. And if we, if we believe all the numbers on hunger and poverty uh, and malnutrition in India over the last 40 years, uh, the answer would be public agencies haven't been doing anything to improve food security, so they failed desperately. But having said that, I think public agencies do have a role. One role, uh, government has a role. One role is massive investments <coughs> in agriculture productivity, especially smallholder agriculture productivity, because that's the primary engine for growth and poverty reduction. But I'm an advocate for less government once it comes to food supply systems, food distribution systems, et cetera. There are so many other ways to do safety nets other than physically taking food and giving it to people who need food. There's several other options, and there are ways in which you can do it much, much better. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, we should also acknowledge that uh, any challenge, whether it's poverty or nutrition, it is linked to better governance. Uh, so the, uh, the, this is where we have found that in the country there are differentials between state and intra-state or interstate disparities. Uh, the second point is that in respect of uh, Panchayati Raj, Dr. Kuhn had uh, asked this, there is a standing committee on health and nutrition of the Panchayati Raj institution. Uh, in many states where their participation is uh, is uh, fund function functionary like Kerala, they, uh, they they are functional entities, and uh, we want to engage them in a, in a gradual manner. I think in, there are various devolutions, and uh, the the, uh, the constitutional arrangement is that the state has to empower them uh, in respect of devolution of those 29 or 34 subjects, uh, which is there to local bodies. Um, the only thing is, as I, as I say, we are poised uh, here where inclusive growth is very important, uh, it, not only in uh, jargon, but in reality. Uh, where there are extreme hunger and uh, deprivation, there should be a special package and a special feeding program, I must uh, acknowledge that. And uh, we must push, uh, 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 give, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the, the final push in delivery all, all across, all across sector to, to make it happen. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And uh, Stuart has promised to show us a magic that within two minutes he can wrap up the entire thing. Stuart. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Thank you. And I'm trying to, let me see. Thank you. Can you just put that? Just full screen. Full screen. Yes, yeah, we've got two minutes. So. First, just to thank everybody for uh, being here still at this time. Um, we, um, we're still ongoing with the Pritandi project. We're trying to wrap up. We will be wrapping this up, bringing together possibly a special supplement of a journal, maybe EPW. We, we, we need to discuss that. I'm just, I can't really fully capture the richness and the depth of, of and the breadth of discussions that we've been having in the presentations. Just 12 quick, well, what could be construed as take-home bullet points. Firstly. Agriculture, nutrition, and health, in reality, converge in many different ways, but they don't in policy and practice, not only in India and else, elsewhere, we find that. There are bi-directional links. It's important for agriculture, it's important for nutrition and health. Nutrition and health is important for agriculture. Again, a lot of evidence. There are synergies because of that. On the negative side, if we don't get that right, there are vicious cycles that can kick in. Nutrition-sensitive agricultural development is absolutely essential for underpinning and sustaining nutritional progress in India. The agriculture sector can do a lot more for nutrition, but it is, of course, and this has been mentioned, it is, of course, not enough. Nutrition security is very different to food security. The PDS only deal, deals with one part of food security, actually, the quantity part. It doesn't really deal with the quality part. <laughs> nutrition security requires food. It requires care, caring practices, capacities, health, access to health care, access to a healthy environment. We have to keep that on board. We have to think in terms of nutrition of the thousand days that starts at conception, goes through pregnancy in the first two years of a child's life. That's the engine for nutritional improvement across the life cycle. We've talked about uh, declines in per capita calorie consumption, some trends, changing diets. Professor Sashdev has warned about the 
the double burden aspect. On one hand, we have undernutrition. On the other hand, there is overnutrition and there's rapid shifts uh, towards that. That, again, is global, but it's happening very much also in India. We have no real evidence, no real research underway on that. That's a big gap. Seven, uh, inequalities. Very much, what is it, what's it required to drive not only pro-poor economic growth, but pro-nutrition, nutrition-responsive economic growth, and there's a, there's a brief on that. Inequalities across socioeconomic lines, gender, tribal, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, with regard to geography, with regard to urban-rural. Three of the seven pathways that Sunita put up at the beginning and that we've been looking and where we do find evidence relate to the roles of women in agriculture, in livelihoods, and in protecting child nutrition. Women's power, their control over resources, their own health and nutritional status with regard to the intergenerational cycle of malnutrition is absolutely fundamentally important. That's local, national evidence, international evidence. There are several disconnects. I think there's a conceptual disconnect. Again, I've talked about nutrition and food security being different. Data, we just don't have enough data sets that have both the economic side and the nutrition side in one, in one data set. We don't have enough longitudinal panel data sets to be able to track changes over time. We've talked about the policy disconnect, two different communities often not talking to each other. Training, where do we find agricultural uh, workers and professionals being trained in basics of nutrition? Big gaps remaining. Uh, we need monitoring uh, of the nutrition interactions with agriculture. We need to look at impact, having nutrition as an impact indicator for agricultural uh, relevant programs. And that needs to be linked to incentives and accountability. It needs to mean something if those indicators are moving in one direction or another. Eleven, we talked about the relevance quality a little bit on the targeting of food nutrition security programs, PDS, NREGA, uh, Midday Mills, ICDS. Often these are, there's a perverse geographical targeting. These programs tend to exist where, in a way, they're less needed because they exist because of the, that's where the infrastructure is. That's not necessarily where the poverty and deprivation is. Quality, we've talked a lot about universalization, but also what about quality, quality of programs? Uh, it's not just the coverage issue. We need to think of that. Finally, and relating to all of this, and again, it's been touched on, it's fundamentally important, governance issues. Governance here relating to the triad of capacity, uh, accountability, and responsiveness. It's fundamental in terms of bridging these disconnects or, or these or roadblocks between uh, groups working at, 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 at different angles on this program. And at the grassroots level, we're talking ultimately about convergence. If nutrition is multifaceted, it requires multi-sectoral inputs. They need to be there. All the buttons need to be pressed at the same time. Thanks. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, if you had patience for half a two remarks. Uh, panelists gave us wonderful views on different issues. Uh, from the paradox of high growth and high malnutrition rates in this country. Uh, let me remind that uh, uh, this is the very question uh, that was put by the Prime Minister four years back to IFPRI, that this is unacceptable, and that's how the big nutrition program actually in New Delhi office started off from that question. We are still groping, and I think it needs still further research into that. Uh, Prabhu's uh, insight into the fact that uh, district level growth rates wherever they have been high in agriculture for a long time also have uh, uh, lower malnutrition rates. Uh, that's uh, interesting and perhaps would be worth looking at it again. And you did not add Kerala. Kerala has the smallest holding size and the highest actually productivity in terms of value of output. And it's all cash crops. They don't grow <coughs> cereals. So it's a very interesting case. Uh, Punjab on one side and Kerala on the other and both. Of course, other factors also count. And that's a question from the chairman's uh, chair I'm putting to the audience. Do we have an idea that how much agriculture accounts and how much other factors account? That's where the econometricians need to struggle and work out what is the relative weightage of these very factors and therefore what public programs or private programs need to be given at the margin? What is the marginal rate of return on that? I think that we have, that's a hard nut to crack because the policy implications will come out of that. And lastly, one thing that was not discussed here, and I want to put it to my nutrition experts here on the panel and in the audience. You know, sometimes we come up that if you look at the child mortality rate in the country, there has been reasonably good progress. 
So when you are improving on the child mortality rate, they are swelling up the ranks of the malnourished children. So when you observe at a point of time, only the stock of the malnourished children, you don't see much of a difference because even if 4% are going out every year, but 4% are being added from this improvement, and therefore just looking at a point of time, perhaps. So when this stabilizes, the improvement in child mortality stabilizes at a lower level, perhaps we will see a major outflow going out from the malnutrition and major improvement may come in. Maybe we'll discuss these issues uh, over a cup of tea or now lunch is waiting for all of us. And a good round of applause for all the panelists here. Thank you.